Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Geo Coast. Um, today, I'm meeting a very interesting man, Jerome Lorden, who really connected his life with the sea. Hello, Jerome. Hello, Max. So, tell me if you will, Jerome, about what, what are you doing now? Uh, I run Kinsale Harbour Cruises. Um, we do cruises around Kinsale Harbour during the tourist season from March until October. And you do it on this boat? Yeah? I do it on this boat, the Spirit of Kinsale, yeah. which is uh, licensed for 50 passengers. Right, it's quite impressive. So what's the nature of the business? Like, do you get a lot of interest from tourists in what you do? Uh, we do. During the primary months of July and August, uh, primarily our business would be 70% Irish and American, mm -hmm. maybe 20% uh, European and maybe 10% between uh, British, Australian, Canadian, other nationalities. Okay, so there's a lot of actually interest from local people. Huh? Well, not necessarily local to here, local but local to, to Ireland. Island, yeah. To, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you end up doing this? Um, I ended up doing this, um, I got out of commercial fishing 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of commercial fishing, I was looking for a new opportunity. So I went to college for a few years and the first year I was in college, this vessel came up for sale and I purchased this vessel. I carried on um, my interest in tourism through study in UCC and, and this at the same time and now I'm doing this full time. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing this um, harbour tours, uh, Jerome, like, are you only bringing people around or are you actually telling them some stories about the coast, about the history? Or? Yes, I have a recorded commentary and the reason it's recorded is that um, if I was to give a live commentary myself, I would be doing it six, seven times a day some days, which mm -hmm. is, it's not feasible when you're driving a boat at the same time and watching where you're going, you have a lot of traffic. So it's recorded and it's primarily historical, uh, geographical, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of emphasis on place names because mm -hmm. of my interest in place names. And again, it's a marine related history of Kinsale Harbour. Jerome, what would be your personal connection with the sea? Why, why, why you decided to connect your life with the sea? With uh, time my connection with the sea is all to do with where I was brought up. I was brought up on the old head of Kinsale, mm -hmm. on the seashore. Uh, I was brought up in a pub where you got a lot of older men who came in and they spent a lot of their time uh, during the war years, maybe at sea or doing mm -hmm. fishing, lobster fishing and coastal fishing. And um, so, um, I, I developed my interest in the sea through that and by going fishing with, these, with the older generation, learning place names, learning about fish, learning about the coast. And I had, a, a, I suppose, a natural induction into, into the sea. Mm -hmm. And at what age have you started um, getting involved in this maritime oh, activities? I, I'd say when I was, um, I was going out fishing with older people when I was 10, 11, 12, right. you know, so, and... Actually commercial fishing? Like. No, no, well, no, oh, they were commercial mm -hmm. fishing, hauling lobster pots, but I went out with them. Helping them? Helping yeah. them and, you know, learning a little bit and yeah. all that, yeah. So how old were you when you got your first boat? Huh? Oh, my, um, well, my uncle um, passed on when I was about 13 or 14 and he let his in his will, he left his punt, his mm -hmm. little boat to me, mm -hmm. and that was my first boat. All right, so that's how it all started. That's how it all started. Do you still own yes. that boat or is it gone? I owned the boat then. Yeah, but it's do only you still have boat. it or is it gone? No, now? God, it's gone. It's only, it was only a 14 foot Norwegian punt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. all. But I did a bit of lobster fishing in it and fishing for pollock and exploring and yeah. And how did you develop your career as um, commercial fisherman? Like, did you went through many fishing vessels? And I, I did, yes. I, th I think when. Um, I went to school, I went away to boarding school and at the, uh, during my summer holidays I was always fishing every summer, lobster fishing, you know, with my own pots mm -hmm. and I also worked on the lighthouse in the old head for two different summers. When the light, before the lighthouses went automatic, they took some local people in mm -hmm. to fill in for the, the shortfall and light keepers. So, and that was the first job I ever applied for when I finished school was a light keeper, but the lighthouses right. went automatic. So the next nearest thing I could do was fishing. So I went fishing. When I went to the National Fishery School mm -hmm. in Greencastle. Do you remember what year was it when uh, the lighthouses went uh, automatic? Uh, um, I was working on the old head lighthouse, I think, in 1975 or 1976. And it was probably a year or two later that the, the lighthouse, late 70s, sometimes mm -hmm. they went automatic. So then a lot of people lost their jobs because yes. the lighthouse. Well, they were, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And um, what, what, what type of fishing have you done? I've done lots of different types of fishing. Um, 
I, initially, as I say, we started off with small boat lobster fishing, mm -hmm. and then I went to the fisheries college in Donegal, uh, where you learn net making, navigation, you know, cookery, all sorts of things associated with life on a fishing boat. I first few, three years I was fishing was out of Castletown Bear, and then Galway, done more east, um, the east coast out of Kinsale, all around the Irish coast. I fished in Australia for for maybe six months, and I fished in New Zealand for another while. For working six for months. somebody else. Yeah, working for somebody else. I fished in Cornwall for two years and mm. new out of Newland on a beam trawler. So I've done lots of different types of fishing, from midwater pelagic fishing for herring, mm -hmm. um, bottom trawling for whitefish, um, perch, or say netting. Fly, that's fly, Scottish fly mm -hmm. dragging for whitefish, um, static netting, gill netting, um, lobster fishing, sole netting, trawling with my own boats when I had my own boats mm -hmm. later on in my career. So I've done lots and lots of different types of fishing. So you were not always working for yourself, you worked for oh, other companies no, no, and no, people? No, yeah, yeah, always, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, what do you think, like, uh, did you enjoy it or did you do it just for money? Uh, a combination of both, you know, it was uh, sometimes I hated it and sometimes I loved it. Mm. <laughs> it, it that, is, that is the nature of fishing. When the weather is bad yeah. and you're not making as much money and you're rolling around and you don't feel very well, um, you don't, it's not a good life. And when you're making lots of money, the weather is fine and you're catching lots of fish, it's nothing better, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so Jerome, as I understand, you've been fishing from <coughs> mid-70s, um, yeah? From 1976 until uh, 2005, 28 years. Yeah, so uh, like that's a long uh, yeah. period of time. And yes. in your opinion, how did the fishing industry evolve from mid 70s to early 2000s? Um, there was huge change in that time. Absolutely huge change. Um, in the mid to late 70s, there was a, a herring bonanza. There was a lot of money made at mm. herring at that time, and. Uh, I think the herring fishing wasn't managed very well at that time and a lot of the, even the whitefish fisheries they weren't managed very well either because um, well, there was no quota which suited everybody but prices in Ireland were, uh, were poor because we were on the periphery of, of the European market we didn't get great money for fish um, there was a lack of regulation that we're, we're paying a price for today in that uh, mesh sizes for cut-ins back then were very, very, 80, 90, 100 millimetre today. And um, I would say if I was to find fault with back then, okay, there was a bonanza, there should have been more regulation back then. And maybe we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about the quotas that were brought in? Uh, I, when quotas came in, that was towards the end of my fishing career. Mm. Um, on paper, it works, but on, uh, but Ireland has got a very poor deal when it comes to quotas because of our, you know, traditional um, catches. We, we got a very poor deal in relation to our European partners in our own waters. Very, very poor deal. And I always feel that, as most people involved with the sea in Ireland feel that, uh, fishing was a sacrificial lamb for benefits to our agriculture and the rest of the economy in Ireland, that fishing was sacrificed for that. Mm -hmm. Roman, continuing talking about f fishing, um, did you enjoy more working for yourself when you were in charge or working for somebody else? Oh, I enjoyed working for myself. More. And did you have a crew or did you do it on your own? I, I had three different boats during my fishing career. Uh, my first boat, I was in partnership with another guy. I bought my first boat in mm -hmm. France about 1977, an old 60-foot uh, French trawler, Sidewinder. And you had other people working for you as well? Yeah, we had, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does it work with somebody who is not familiar with the industry? You catch fish, then where do you sell the fish? Do you need to find your own market? Do you sell it to fish market, to well, some shop? Or? Yes, at very back then in, in, the, um, in the 70s and 80s, we landed, we were landing, sometimes we were landing to individual buyers and then the cooperatives, uh, Union Hall Fishman's Co-op, Castletown Bear Fishman's Cooperatives, the cooperatives got stronger and the prices got a bit better. So we were landing mm -hmm. to cooperatives most of the time. So basically selling it to a wholesaler who then would distrib distribute yeah, it yeah. to shops? Yeah, it was auctioned yeah? in Skibbereen or uh, Castletown Bear or whatever. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. And in, in your years of uh, being out at sea fishing, mm. uh, do you, what were the most, uh, let's say, adventurous moments? Maybe, I mean, meeting some whales, dolphins or like, uh, anything unusual happened to you during your career at sea? 
Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I was never really aware of whales until recent years when I got away from commercial mm. fishing here about whale watching. But I have ab absolutely no recollection of seeing whales during my fishing career. <laughs> it's a, maybe because we weren't watching for them yeah. or because you're underneath a shelter deck and you're, you're gutting fish and clearing mm. the deck or you're in the wheelhouse. But I, I don't have, and it's like everything else, you know, they were probably there, but unless you're looking for something, mm -hmm. you don't see it, you know. But I remember one occasion when I was out offshore a couple of, like 200 miles mm. to the west of Ireland and a huge whale, like maybe 15 meter long, jumped out of the water in yeah, front yeah. of the vessel, yes, yeah. just a few meters yeah. in front. Like uh, yeah. that, so. uh, One thing that I, I do remember that kind of stands out, one day, um, uh, uh, maybe 25 miles south of the old head, and um, we were hauling uh, the trawl, and a killer whale just was right underneath the boat, right mm -hmm. just next to us, underneath the boat, didn't came under the boat, the boat no. just as we were hauling the net, <laughs> and just a flash like that. I, I remember that, mm. but... Um, <sighs> I don't know where there are any remarkable things are up because you, you forget stuff like that when you're working and you're tired mm -hmm. and maybe you take you see it's so all you take no notice you know but um, it's not like when somebody goes out on a boat for the first time or very occasionally sights and they, they're amazed by everything you become immune to what's around you mm -hmm. when you're working at sea all the time maybe that's my answer you know and do you remember seeing sharks? Uh, I know, like the, sometimes people see basking sharks. Oh yeah, lots of basking sharks. Yeah. Yes, when uh, particularly in May, in the month of May, and mm. on the shore when you're hauling lobster pots and all that, there are lots of basking sharks in by the shore. Lots and lots of basking sharks. Yeah. But they they, they can't bite you like the, no no the they're plankton uh, feeders. Yes. Yeah. And one time actually, I, I had I was uh, when I was small, I was only about fourteen, mm -hmm. and I was uh, pollock fishing, and I had a basking shark, and he. He was scratching his back on the keel of the punt, and I was very worried. <laughs> but um, and May, I think they used to come in in the kelp when they had lice, and they rubbing their backs off the kelp and, and the rocks mm -hmm. in close. And then Norwegians used to come here that time, um, fishing for sharks, for basking sharks. Actually killing them? Uh, yes, yeah, every year for their, liver, for their livers. Is it still legal? No, they don't do it anymore. The, mm -hmm. I think that fishery is gone over about 20, 25 years. But they'd come to Dunmore East, Kinsale, Castletone Bear, and they, only in very fine weather they'd operate and they had the crow's nest and they harpoon them. They took the liver out, extracted the liver and left the carcass go. Yeah. yeah. But they were very, there were a lot of basking sharks back then, an awful lot of basking. They were very plentiful, mm -hmm. you know. And being out at sea for like uh, now nearly like over 40 years, yeah? Mm -hmm. What, in your personal opinion, do you notice any changes about the sea conditions and the weather? <clears throat> what it was mid 70s, when it was <coughs> early 2000s, now. I, 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 in recent years, I've noticed that always when I was fishing, after the summer and coming up to Christmas, you get a few gales, nothing too severe, mm. and you get the bad weather in January and February, always very bad weather. But in recent years, we get a lot of the bad weather. We're getting a bad weather before Christmas, which was kind of, I don't remember that a lot before, you know. So and it's in the last like 10, 20 years? Uh, yeah, or? maybe in the last uh, 10, uh, 8, 10 years, I've noticed that more and more. Um, again, weather is something that when you're a fisherman, you don't think too much about it. You just go out, you know, mm. and you don't dwell on the weather. If, if you dwelt on the weather, you'd, you wouldn't go out, you know, you mm. just take no notice of it, you know. And the longer you stay out, the less, and no matter how bad the weather is, if you're out all the time, you take no notice of it after a while. Yeah. You it's just same get as with used. surfing, like you know, yeah. normal people you, you stay just home get, you and just you go get, out. You just like, get yeah. used to it, you know, you yeah. stay at it. And if, if you're going out into bad weather, it seems very bad the first day, you know, because you've been ashore for a few days. Mm. But if you're out and you've been out for five or six days and the weather gets bad, you know, it's, it's a gale, it's going to blow, it's going to be a bit of a, 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 a strong wind, but you take no notice of it. You know, you're just, you're acclimatized to it, so you mm -hmm. don't take any notice. And, and if it's dark and you're under a shelter deck at night working, you don't know what the, it's like outside. You know it's bad, but you don't know how bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people told me, like, um, also some mariners, like, working in the Navy, mm. saying that uh, they noticed that in the last few years the frequency and strength of gales increased. Would you agree with this? No? <coughs> or there's always been bad that's, weather? That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't. 
I, I wouldn't really agree with that. You know, there have always been Gales there, but I think the media and social media and Gales, people always go on about storms. But what they really mean are Gales. Mm. We get Gales all the time. That's yes. a natural occurrence. But with storms in the past, you normally in Ireland you get, in, from where I remember the past, a storm is force 10 on the Beaufort scale of wind. You'd get that two or three times a year. Maybe up in Donegal you get it more frequently because you're mm -hmm. further north and you get the, the, the deeper low pressures. Um, but you get that two or three times a year. But everything, even a gale now, people get alarmed about it and it's a storm and it's a hurricane, it's this. And, and there's a lot of over-exaggeration attached to weather. So um, I would say we've had more frequent storms, yes, in recent years. But, um, but gales, we have the same amount of gales as we always have, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, actually, the yeah, what you said is very interesting. Yeah, I I, I agree with, yeah. with this, like because like there's a lot of exaggeration about the uh, everything is climate yes, change yes, now. Yes, everything is yeah. Because it's fashionable, like and, uh, and and we know from you know from reading uh, what weather climate uh, it's very there's a what people don't differentiate I think is between climate and weather. There are two different things. Weather is short term; it's what's happening mm. now and next year, and, that, and climate is something that you have to look at. Uh, if you want to look at climate retrospectively, you need three or four hundred years to see is there yes. any difference. And there is no records, we we yeah. can't tell. No, mm. you know, there are no records. We can't tell if this is climate change or if it's a period of bad weather. We don't know. You know, that's how I see it. You know, mm. yeah. But the frequent, uh, the, 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 the ferocity of some of the storms we've had recently, particularly Ophelia, I don't remember anything like that previously, as, as bad as that, mm -hmm. you know. Because I know, talking to fishermen, a lot of fishermen lost their pots and lost a lot of their gear that time. And it really, even in, when they put their pots in deeper water, they lost them, you know. So obviously the turbulence was going down to the bottom and all that. Now, and I, what I do remember about bad weather one time, I remember, one winter when I was fishing the last boat I had, uh, which was a 38 foot little trawler, and um, we had a period of very, very bad weather. And I went out after it, and the first day I went out, um, I was shooting the trawl in the morning, and um, we were just, the wires were going out, and we were just about to block up, but you get the marks even, and she went over like that, shipped the rails nearly, and we came fast, which means that you get caught on something on the bottom, on a place I never got caught on before. So obviously the turbulence had unearthed something, maybe an anchor, a bit mm -hmm. of wreckage or a bit of rock or something. That, and we were fast for 10 hours before we got the trawl back, you know, stuck on the bottom and that. Mm -hmm. And on a place where I never saw anything before, but talking to divers, they tell me this all the time, mm -hmm. particularly in places on the East Coast where you've got the Arctic banks and south of that, where you've got a sandy bottoms that they've dived there, they've seen a wreck, the skeleton of a wreck, they've gone back and it's covered again. So this, this sort of thing. It's a mobile environment. Yeah, a mobile environment. And this, this happens a lot, you know, that, mm. that seems. And particularly in very turbulent weather, inshore, that seems to, seems to happen. Mm. And I was listening to a podcast actually a few weeks ago. It was uh, Boucher Hayes about the Falcon Blanco up off Finnish Buffin looking for the Falcon Blanco. And where they had dived previously in the sand was, and they saw the, they think the ballast rock, that no more, it was all rock, if the mm -hmm. terrain had completely changed, which is, is a good example of, of this sort of thing happening, you know. And is, is it true that um, some fishermen can't swim? Uh, I, in the past, yeah, there was uh, <laughs> that. That was a, a lot of fishermen. I'd say can't swim. The older, probably the older guys. The younger guys, I'd imagine, can. Yeah, yeah. I'm a poor swimmer. I can swim, but I'm a poor swimmer. But do you like being in the water, or you prefer to be on the boat? Yeah. I prefer to be on the boat, <laughs> but I, I do. I, I try and go swimming as much as I can, even in the winter. You know, mm. just for health benefit, yes, for the benefit yeah. of your health. You know. Jerome, what's your take on uh, maritime traditions? and how they influence like the people of Ireland? <clears throat> I think there's a terrible apathy in Ireland towards maritime traditions and the sea. Um, in Ireland, most coast people who live by the coast, if you show them a mackerel or a pollock, um, probably within about three miles of the coast, they'd know what it is. But once you go inside that, they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't know one kind of fish from the other. Mm. And uh, whereas in other European countries you go a long way inland and they're, they're more aware of the sea. It's one of the paradoxes about Ireland that people are quite ignorant about the sea. Now that's changing because, and it's changing in that there are more people using the sea for leisure, mm -hmm. you know, for windsurfing, sailing, 
kite surfing, all that. And they're getting, so their, that interest wasn't there before, that's developing. So people are more aware of the sea now, but the awareness of the sea and uh, in Ireland, it, it's one of the great um, paradoxes about Ireland that we're so unaware of what's, that we're actually an island, hmm. you know. So apart it's, it's, from the coastal, apart thing, from uh, the coastal people, so people who actually live on the coast, they're aware of the sea of the type of yes. fish, all sand, sorts. gravel, yes. whatever. Everything. But like people who are a little bit inland, yeah. like they're very detached. And, and what's uh, interesting about that as well, Max, is that um, I might go if I went inland, maybe 10, 15 miles, I might know hardly anybody. But when you go along the coast, you know people everywhere. The the coastal community all around Ireland. If you've been involved in fishing and different mm. types of marine activities, you tend to know people all the way along the coast. That's your community. That's interesting. Uh. Yeah. And so it's actually, you know, they heard a very interesting thing on the radio and they were talking about um, territorial boundaries and people from uh, this, having an affinity with people from your own country. And somebody said, uh, they made an interesting remark and said that that's disappearing a little bit in some ways, is that people people who communicate in social media, that they have an affinity with each other, even though they might be in different parts of the mm. world, speak a different language, but that's their community. It's not your territorial boundary anymore, which is a new departure. It's, it's, it's just different. It's, some, it's a change that's happening in the mm -hmm. world, you know. Jerome, can you think of any maritime traditions maybe associated with navigation, with sailing, fishing, which um, originate from the past and which are still active now, which were there 100 years ago and continue to be, for example, like all boats have a compass. Eh? So yeah. You can say it's a maritime tradition, all boats have a mm. bell. So can you think I, of something? I, 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 I'll give you lines? an example now, Max. It just, and it's an, it's an indirect answer to your question. When I started fishing, um, Decca was just coming in, you know, and Consul and Decca, and there were the navigational modes, there was no GPS. And Decca was very erratic, you know, because, you know, your clocks would spin around mm. and you would be towing at night on a track and it's drawing a nice straight line, your track plotter, next thing it would go zigzag all over the place and your signal is very bad. <clears throat> and then you might come fast, haul up your tear, your nets. So that was going on a lot. And then during the daytime, it was you were watching landmarks, you put that post over that mountain and you get that island, uh, like off Cape Clear, there's the, 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 um, the I'm just trying to think of it off Cape, the, the uh, three, three islands in one, it looks like three, no, 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 there's, there's a, a name for it, I'm just trying, to, I, I'll forget about it, leave that go because mm -hmm. I've forgotten. Um, Is it Baltimore, West Cork? Uh, yeah, it's south of, 15 miles south of Baltimore, landmarks that they used to use. Like Hare Island? No, it was it. it I, I've forgotten, sorry, just yes, for don't worry. But, anyway, but we used to use landmarks and fishermen used landmarks a lot, um, you know, that time. And if it was a foggy day, it was difficult to tow because you couldn't see your landmarks. Mm -hmm. And then Decca came in, that made life a bit easier. We were able to record your tracks. And then Decca was inaccurate. So then GPS came in and that was rev revolutionary. Decca was, it contributed a lot to <clears throat> the way fishing has gone because it was so accurate and you could go into places before that you would have difficulty going into before and not tear your nets. There was a huge degree of accuracy. <clears throat> and today I, I, there's a great um, ad I saw on the fishing news one time at the back and it was a new piece of electronic equipment and said fish in this area have had their chips because of the electronic chips mm -hmm. were contributing so much to catching fish. It was so efficient. So that efficiency was not there. 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. That efficiency is there today. Fishing has become super, super efficient, you know. Because of the technology. Because of uh, technology, yeah. Super efficient. Yeah. Yeah, so. And what about maritime superstitions? Oh, there's lots of, uh, particularly in this part of the coast from here, west, lots of superstitions. Lots. You never, for example, you never mention a sheep aboard the boat. A sheep is always a woolly. Uh, you never mention a fox. A fox is... Um, bushy tail or a, a rabbit is a cotton tail you know there's different names you don't mention those things when you're on the boat you're on the boat no, no 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 it's just bad luck there's, there's a lot of superstition I never heard of this, yeah. yes if you're going fishing in the morning and you see a red-haired woman you don't go fishing that's very bad luck you know 
if what your wife is a redhead, cat? I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble there. Um, so they're, they're, they're some of the ones. Um, no connections with black cats, no? No, I'm not, not, I don't know anyone. So not fox, not red haired woman, so a connection uh, with a uh, fox. Fox, yeah. red haired woman, donkey, and a rabbit. They, they, so they, you they, can't talk about them? You can't, you can't them. talk about them at all. You, you just say something else because that's, that's. People get. The older generation would get quite upset about that. Uh -huh. The older generation of fishermen, yeah, yeah. Anything else you can think of? Um, <clears throat> I think a crow on top of the mast was a bad sign as well. All oh, right. Of uh, you know maybe somebody had died or something like that. Yeah. If you saw a crow on a the mast. A seagull is okay. Yeah. A seagull is okay, but a crow was this a bad one sign. sitting up there. Yeah, yeah. and um, and also again, it's not a superstition, but the signs. Uh, I used to always think that um, when you're when the weather is the forecast is bad and you see the storm petrels, you know the small little birds. When you see them behind the wake of the boat flying very low to the water, mm -hmm. you know, like that. And they, they never land when they're at sea, but you see all that. That's a very bad sign of the weather. It means <coughs> it's going to deteriorate in the future. Yes. <coughs> you know, the weather is, is going to deteriorate. And then when you see some days, you might see a day, again, like today, that the visibility is amazing. You can see a long, long way away. When you see that, there's usually a, a sign of bad weather. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I heard a, an old man, fisherman, one time when I was small, small going out fishing with him, and the lobster was grabbing onto the inside of the pot like that and he could try to get the lobster yes. out and he said that's a sign of bad weather because the lobster knows that and so the bad true, weather right? is coming so they, they hang true? on. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and <laughs> when you get when you get lightning, thunder, um, you get congers, lots of congers in the lobster pots, mm. you know. And on, if you're fishing on a fishing line baited hook, the congers you'll get lots of congers. So just little things like that, you know. Mm. It's very interesting. So basically there are some and, and, things, and it's kind of part of folklore. It, of it is a bit, yeah, it's kind of borderline folklore and, uh, tr the, the, you know, f but with a grain of truth. Like, yeah? and, and another thing I've noticed, I used to often notice, and I've noticed several times, um, is that just before a period of bad weather, today is calm, tomorrow is very bad, that when you're fishing, you get a lot of fish the day before the weather. It's Maybe bad. they feed a lot because they can't feed when the weather, they know the bad weather so is coming. So you think the fish knows that the bad weather is coming? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I've often seen some huge shot, big shots of whitefish. Um, I remember one particular time in Galway, just before a very bad blow. I remember another time out here, before there was very bad weather, we got very, very good fishing for the years. Now, that's only anecdotal. That's only yes, my yes. own imagination. It may or may not be true. But, but they don't I know that the troll is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know if I still had the fishing boat, and it was calm today and I knew it was blowing tomorrow, I'd be very anxious to get out today. I think, you know, mm -hmm. again, I've no scientific proof of this. This is just your inherent experience that you... Well, a lot of scientists don't have scientific <coughs> proof for whatever they're saying. Like, yeah. um, and there are fishermen. I, I know fishermen who, you know, when they go out in the morning, older fishermen, some of them retired now, that they know instinctively where to go. They will always go to the right mm -hmm. place at the right day at the right time because it's that inherent knowledge that's built up over yes. many many years you can't buy that you just can't you know but from my own personal experience like fishing off a kayak just with the yes, fishing yeah, line yeah. i kind of know like you need to go to the area where there's bedrock on 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 the bottom yeah yeah, there. yeah. and in the sandy area you don't catch yeah, anything, yeah, yeah, but yeah fish prefers the rock yeah? yeah yeah in this way like i think the data collected by the informer could be of relevance to Fisheries? What do you well, think, like? well, I'll tell you, the interesting thing about the Inframar is that uh, when Inframar came out first, and I, I looked at the Inframar site for out here, mm. and it was exactly the same as I had on my plotter, identical. So no different. Knew it all, right? We knew it all. The fishermen, all the fishermen knew that so you already. Knew where we, we knew, we knew sand, all that. We, all, we, we just, if you look at a fisherman's chart, it's mm. ideal, uh, identical, just, it's but it's different. But it's don't. Pencil, you or? don't have the. Tree, it's not 3D. It's mm. just some. It's with a pen on a plotter, and it's all the tracks are marked out and the bits of rock. And it's the same. The fishermen always yes, had this yes. information. So likewise, uh, like I spent a few years mapping deep water corals to yes, the west yeah, of yeah, Ireland. Yeah. But like I read that fishermen knew about them <coughs> over a hundred years ago. Well, I don't know about a hundred years ago, but if you go very, very deep, they probably didn't. But out where the coral is at the edge of the shelf, maybe down to 400 fathoms, 500. Mm. I don't know. Is there any fishing after that much by Irish boats? But when they were fishing for orange roughy, 
a few years back. Mm -hmm. They were fishing in the deep water in the coral, that rough ground and all that. So they would have been aware of that. They would have been aware of coral there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said that to somebody one time, they said, no, that's rubbish. But I think, no, it's uh, true. I, I don't think people give fishermen enough credit for what they know about the sea. I think fishermen, and I'd say this, fishermen know more about the sea than any other sector of maritime society because they spend more time on the sea than anybody else. They're like seabirds. They're there all the time. The Navy go out now and then they come back in, in yes, and out. Yes. Yachtsmen go out and not when it's a nice day and all that. Fishermen are always on the sea. Always, always, always. And so when I, when I was fishing, if you went fishing every single day, every day, every day, and you don't stop, you're always catching fish. You're catching fish all the time. But if you stop and you take three or four days off, maybe the first day you go, you catch very little because you're going on the information from the previous day and you're, it's, you're being up to date mm -hmm. all the time. You're in the zone. Yes. And then when you stop, you're out of the zone. You have to but get back into it But then you have a problem of storing fish, no? Sorry? You have a problem oh, of oh, storing Oh, no, you can stay. You, today, you can keep fish on ice up to 21 days. Mm -hmm. And you have refrigerated boats today. You can, Is it frozen it, then? It, dep or? it depends what kind of a boat you mm -hmm. have. But... When I say go out every day, success, even a small boat that I had, a 38 footer, I'd go out today, but I'd land tonight, and then I'd go out tomorrow right. morning and land again. Yeah. So you, you were on top of your job because you knew where mm -hmm. to go each day. So yeah. you don't freeze fish on the board? No, no, no. Unless you're on a freezer trawler, you mm. do. Yeah, but not, you know, not on the kind of boats. You got. The, the boats, some of the, the boats that fish for prawns, they've got freezing facilities, frozen prawns, yeah. Mm -hmm. Prawn freezers, that's more the common type of... Um, all the bigger boats are doing that kind of fishing now, prawn mm -hmm. freezing. Yeah. And in, the, in, in your view, what is the future of the fishing industry in Ireland? I actually think there'll be very, very few people fishing in, a few, in, in, you know, in the next maybe 15, 20 years, because there's no new blood, no new people going into mm. it. Uh, the crews at the moment on most Irish boats, apart from the successful ones, are probably non-Irish. Um, there's no new people going into it. And with regulation and everything else, I can see the fishing industry going away back. Even since I was fishing uh, in recent years, a lot of the local fishermen here have retired. There are less boats mm -hmm. and there are guys getting out, selling out because a lot of it is paperwork, administration, restrictions. And um, I heard, over, heard a fisherman one day saying that the fun had gone out of it before you go out and it was a bit of an adventure. And, and I used to find that as well. You go off, you leave Kinsale on a Sunday night, you go into Labdi for three or four days, and you're going to get big, fill up with big prawns like that. There's a great sense of adventure to that. You can't kind of do that anymore, you know, because you've got quotas, you've regulation, you can't do this, you can't do that. It, it's very re over, very regulated. So it, it, um, it hasn't got the free, it was the last of the hunters kind of thing before, but not, not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. It's very regulated. And now probably a lot of the demand, like in terms of consumption, fulfilled by the aquaculture as well, fish farming. I, I don't know about that. In, in Ireland, I, I, what, what really annoys me in Ireland is that, uh, again, an island nation, people cannot differentiate between what's farmed, what's wild, what's not. Mm -hmm. You know, they eat stuff like bass and they say, oh, sea bass, it's wonderful. Sea bass. It's from the it's Mediterranean. Not, it's from the Mediterranean. <laughs> it's farmed. Yeah. And it's not sea bass, it's bass. Mm. In the States, they call it sea bass because you have different types of bass. We have only one type of bass. Mm. So it's actually bass, not sea bass. And it's farmed. It's not. Bass is a protected species in Ireland, so you can't buy wild bass mm. over the country in Ireland. And um, so it's not, uh, you know, people think this is great and farm salmon and all this. There's lots of question marks around of farm course. salmon. Lots of question marks, you know. I heard even like they're adding some color to the food. Oh, you can, you can, you can. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, a supermarket chain can come along and they say, or the, the, the fish farm say, which shade of pink would you like? You know, <laughs> do you want this, this? And they feed them with certain pellets to give them a certain color, you mm. know. So it's, uh, I wouldn't eat, for, I don't eat farm salmon, you know. So. Mm. Well, but sometimes you just don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. No, you, you don't. You come to no. the shop, there's nothing else. No, I know, <laughs> I know that. I know that. Well, generally, it's only the, what, the, basically in our, in, if you go into a fish shop in Ireland, apart, unless they have species from Southeast Asia, most fish is boiled apart from bass, salmon, and uh, maybe prawns from Southeast Asia. You know, gambas and mm. tiger prawns and, and that sort of stuff. Well. They're all farmed. You know, and 
very questionably farmed about what they're mm. eating and of course, well, yeah. <laughs> lots of question marks about that. So apart from that, you know, cod, haddock, flatfish, all, apart from turbot, they do a bit of turbot farming here, but um, generally most of the fish is still wild, you know, yeah. We're, we're lucky in Ireland, in the, I think, in that we're on the cusp, we're in the cold water, but the warm water is, we're on the edge of the warm water, so we get a lot of different species. Here, you know, because of our latitude, mm -hmm. we get a lot of different, and we get a good variety of fish compared to what you get way down south, you know. And Jerome, like now you are, for the last 15 <coughs> years, you're running this uh, yes. Kinsale Harbour yeah, cruises. Yeah, yeah. So you're really kind of contributing towards the development of maritime tourism yes. in Ireland, yeah, in a way. Yeah, like, yeah. And what what's your take on, in general, like how the maritime tourism is developing in Ireland? Are you happy with how it is and the rule and regulations around it yeah. yes it's a lot better than what it was the maritime tourism was was um very very small up to recent times but what has gone down is the angling the angling boats and all mm. that that's they're not as prevalent and um if for kinsale one time in the 1960s when kinsale took off as a tourism resort um angling was huge the trident had a fleet of boats and was blue, they fish for blue shark, for turbot, big cod, ling, the ling rocks, the Lusitania. That's gone. That's not there anymore. There's only probably one angling boat here now and that's working professionally. And what has taken off is kite surfing, surfing, sailing, all sorts of other uh, marine. And a lot of people who don't have a maritime background, they come uh, mm. from inland or somewhere else, they come to the sea and they've taken up all this. And it's kind of new to them and um, so the, there's a kind of a fresh outlook, a, a, a very different outlook on it. Before anybody who was involved in the sea in Ireland in the past came from a maritime background or they lived on the coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And even when I started fishing most people who were involved in fishing came from the coast. Very unusual to get anybody from inland you know and um, the same with any. Whereas nowadays the sea is uh, people from inland are embracing the sea more in you know, the tourism aspect um, whale watching is definitely that's that's one of the big ones I suppose more than mm -hmm. anything else that that's really taken off and um, particularly in uh, Corp Mac and in Baltimore and the southwest coast it funnily enough ironically it hasn't taken off in Kinsale and there are you know this from the start from the old head to mm -hmm. Cape is supposedly one of the best places for work but it, ha it hasn't taken off here you know so there's a niche there for somebody you know so you said an interesting thing you said like Kinsale started to be developed as a tourist attraction from 60s yeah? yes yeah so it wasn't always attractive oh God. To Kinsale to... was a very poor town before the 1960s mm. up Kinsale up to independence in 1921 Kinsale was thriving because you had the, the British, ironically, you had the British garrison in the fort. So you had a lot of vittling and, you mm -hmm. know, they're supplying the fort and the barracks with, with the troops. And then when the British left, uh, Kinsale went into decline from about now. And I think in the 1960s, there was a uh, Terry Wogan on BBC did a programme on Ireland about Kinsale and um, how, what a wonderful picturesque little place it was. And after that, it started to take off. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, my mother, my granduncle had a hotel in Kinsale way back in the 1940s and my mother worked for him, you know. Mm -hmm. And my mother said you could walk from the centre of Kinsale down to the end to get the ferry home to the old head and you'd see nobody. It was a poor town, mm -hmm. and, but it, a very, very poor town, but it had a strong seafaring tradition. All the men went to sea in the Navy. Yes. Kinsale was a bit like Cove, a huge seafaring tradition that went mm -hmm. back and back. And that seafaring tradition you were asking me about traditions earlier yes. and I had forgotten. That seafaring tradition has died in Kinsale. Those men aren't there. People don't go to sea anymore from Kinsale mm -hmm. because the new population, Kinsale is a transient population. There's a new population here and they're not, as, not like in the past where you had the old um, indigenous population who had a strong family and the grandfather and the father mm -hmm. and people way back, they all went to sea. That was in their so family. So this maritime tradition stopped? It's gone. It's gone. Like yeah, it's gone. 40 yeah. years ago? No? Uh, it's gone with about maybe 20, 30 years, you know, mm -hmm. the last of them, you know, yeah. Do you think because people became more lazy or there were more jobs on I, I, I think, I think in general, I, I think that um, as we've become more affluent, people don't want to go to sea anymore. Mm. They're going to sea is, 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 is a tough livelihood, you know, you're spending time away from your family. There are more opportunities ashore and on land than there are at sea. And people are reluctant to spend that kind of time at sea, you know.
I, I, I actually, when I think back on my time at sea, I, I, I find it quite frightening that I, it's like as if you're in prison for a while. You missed all that time. And I know when I stopped fishing and all that, every winter I tried to do something different, learn about something new to make up for all that lost time. Mm -hmm. Because when you're at sea, you can't do night courses. You can't learn different things. All you know is just fishing and the sea and boats and not, nothing else. Yes. So, yes. And it, it takes a while, when you come ashore, it takes a while to adapt, <laughs> you know, to being back on land again. You know, different niceties, social niceties, being PC and all that. It's, it, fishing is quite wild, you know, by comparison, mm. you know. And you are very unusual in a way that after working for so many years, then you decided to change the career and you actually went to college to, mm -hmm. and you yes. did a few degrees. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what, what were they about? Like, and um, where I, this interest came from? I, well, I've always been interested in history and um, archaeology. I've always been interested in that. Mm. So I went to college in 2007 um, and I, um, I, I had this board at the time. So because my season goes from March to October, it allowed me the first few years, mm -hmm. you know, I was doing work on the boat in the winter, but I also went to college. So I did archaeology and Celtic civilization. Was it a night course or full time? No, full time, daytime, oh, yeah. up and down to Cork every day. And um, at the weekends then, my Was time it four off. four years? Yeah? For uh, three years, three, three years. years. Yeah. And then I did a major in archaeology and uh, the rest in Celtic civilization. And then the, when I got after my degree, I did um, a master's in local history. Mm -hmm. So, and um, that was part time, one, one night a week for two years. And um, I, I focused on, um, again, Local place names, minor local place names, you know, along the coast. And how, uh, how do you do this research? How do you, you find you out got about it? the place I, uh, Well, because when I was young, I went fishing with the older fishermen. Mm -hmm. And because the Irish language was only under the surface, their parents would have spoken Irish. So they had, they had a lot of Irish words and, and from the Irish language. And they had different names for fish in Irish. And all the places before GPS or before anything, if you were fishing and you wanted to describe a place, and because... People in the past lived in a small world. We live in a global world today. Mm -hmm. So they knew their own world intimately. So they knew every detail. Yes. They knew every bush, every bird's nest, you know, every name, every place. So every rock and every little cove had a name. So was all it these, in Irish? In Irish, all in Irish. So I collected all these names from the older people and I got mm -hmm. some of them from an older man um, who, who was a neighbour of mine. He, um, he collected a lot of them and before he died, I, I got his collection. I collected more from the other fishermen mm -hmm. and I wrote them all down and I did my thesis on this. And like, were people speaking Irish even when Ireland was occupied by the English? Like, uh, oh yes, yeah, yeah, there were the, 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 the um, I think in the, up about 1900, there were still about 300,000 native speakers still left in the country. Mm -hmm. I think today it's only about 60 who speak it as their natural yes, language. Yes. But in 1900, in the West, there were, there were 300,000. Yeah, yeah. 300, but even here along the coast here, the old head, the galley head, the seven heads, you know, all the way down here. You they were people, all, yeah? There were still Irish speakers there until the 1940s, you know, in, the, in those headlands, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the language has died out, as, as it is all the time, you know. And... Um, yeah. And like, imagine that we are flying over the coastline of yes. this area, like around the Old Head yeah, or yeah. around the Kinsale Harbour. Mm. And can you just imagine this and do a virtual tour around the place names? And then maybe we can use a drone and just go over around them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just give some examples, like um, what, what type of place? Okay, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, well, yeah, in Irish, I would, I'm yeah. just saying like, okay. okay. Can you just uh, give a verbal tour of place names I, I give will, some examples I, I, I and will, how they course. translate into English? Yeah, uh, yeah, I will. And, and it's, I'm reluctant to translate them into English because what happens, because Ireland is an English-speaking country, when you translate them into English, mm. people only use the English version and they throw out the Irish version. Whereas um, as a, a great place name scholar um, said to me one time, he said, Eamon Langford, he said, always interpret the names, don't translate them, interpret them. Mm -hmm. Because Irish is a different language and some things can mean several different things. Mm -hmm. So you might get, you're getting away from the original name, you know. So, uh, for example, um, just one, and this is uh, one, there's a bit of detail behind, uh, near where I lived is a place called um, Cusina di Nabata which means the little cove of the drowned people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a book a few years ago, it was about shipwrecks of Kinsale and Cork McSherry about this area. And um, the story goes that um, there was a local diver, he was in the pub one day and he was asking a local man, did you ever hear of a ship called the Stonewall Jackson? 
you know, she was wrecked in, I think it was 1867, I think. And he said, yeah, I think she, you know, she might have been lost over there because that, the name of that place is Kushina di Nabata, the little cove the drowned people. So the driver went over there. Now, this is folklore. So the driver went there, he dived, and he found a few artifacts. Mm -hmm. And he located where the wreck was because of a place name and because of that bit of local lore. And so there you have um, a cross-disciplined approach. You've got folklore, you've got archaeology, and you've got history. And you go back to the newspaper mm -hmm. archives and it said in the northeast part of Bullens Bay, where we don't know, but now we know because of the place name and because of what the driver found at that place name. You know. So that's it's just an interesting little window into how place names can tell you about different things. Now they're not all as interesting as that. Most of them describe um something geological or geomorphology. Geomor something geomorphology or, or some uh, uh, an odd fewer mythology some to do with fishing you know where you catch certain like Kushina Krohog which means the little cove of the small black pollock mm -hmm. where you will catch small black pollock you know and all that and uh, what's so, the Irish name for the is the Irish name for the sea stack at the old head oh yeah Manan Bui which means Manan is a high rock like a crown mm -hmm. and Bui is yellow and it's because of all the guano from the birds on mm -hmm. it. So it's Muinan Bui. And what about the caves and like the sea tunnels going the, underneath yeah, the, 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 the I, I, does, I don't have any names on the caves, but they're just, um, collectively there's no name actually on the cave yes. itself. But where the, the cliffs, where the caves are, if you go down, if you go down to the castle at the entrance of the golf mm -hmm. course, you go to the right, you look down the cliff, that cliff there is called File at Lower. And File is the Irish for cliff. And floor is the Irish for noise. So it's so, so many noisy. birds nesting there, that's mm -hmm. very noisy, so it's filing at lower. Uh -huh. So a lot of them are self-explanatory. But, you know, if you say the cliff of the noise doesn't, isn't, isn't very interesting, yes, yes. you retain the, the original And what Irish about name. the other side? Uh, the other the side is, is called filing at lower, filing at lower. And uh, again, because I've never seen the word written down, I don't know what it was, is. So I can I guess odd in Irish it means lucky. I doubt if it's called that. There's probably some name that's lost or it's corrupted. And that's what happened when you lose a language, a lot of the names are corrupted mm. over a period of time. So we don't know. And that's the danger. You should never translate it because if somebody says it's the Lucky Cliff, that might be the wrong name mm -hmm. completely. If you have the original Irish name, you, p scholars can play around with it and maybe just... And do you know the original name for the Goat's Island where people swim? In Sadly Cove? Yes. Oh no, I, I don't. I don't know what that name is, but it's... Um, on the older maps, it's down as Knock Rush, mm -hmm. you know, Kunuk Narus. And I don't know, I don't know what it is, no, I don't know that, no. And the place names that you collect, Jerome, like, are you, are you recording them somewhere? Do you oh, put yeah, them I record them, or? yeah. They're, they're on, um, there's a website called Mehel Loganum, and it means Mehel is the Irish for harvesting and coming together, lots of people sharing mm -hmm. work, you know, and it's people from all over country, uh, the country, um, they come together and they put in the names of minor names in their places. So I put my material in there, you know. Is it just a database or is it a map? Oh. It's a map with a database on and people can put it, uh -huh. put in their names. But I, I, uh, I have my thesis on it, but I, sometime I hope to publish it. But it, it's, it's kind of an academic work, but I need to make it readable work for the you know, uh -huh. general public and maybe make a kind of a story out of it, weave a bit of prose. I, I don't know. I'm still thinking about it, you know. And just a few minutes ago, you mentioned that you wrote a book about shipwrecks. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And like, um, w is it a historical book? Like, it's, it's historical just a book, folklore? Yeah. No, it, it, there's, not diving, a, again, oh, the, you, there's, dive a, there's, them, there's no? a bit of folklore, a little bit of archaeology, but it's mostly history. Mm. And did it, you dive to those wrecks? No, I don't dive at all. Yeah. No, I'm so so how, how did you I, I just went them? to the newspaper archives. When mm. I was in college, um, when I was doing my master's, I was asked to do a piece uh, you know, apart from my thesis, a short piece on something, on any topic. So I decided I'd do it on a shipwreck called the Pearl of Gloucester, which was lost to Garrettstown in uh, 1927. And I wrote a piece. I found lots of information in the newspapers about it. And I gave it to my supervisor. And he was, um, he was very interested. He said, uh, God, he said, you, you know, you could write a bit more on that maybe. And, and there's only a couple of years after I thought, God, um, I went looking at the newspapers again. I found loads and loads mm. about shipwrecks. Pretty, it, what's interesting about shipwrecks and the newspapers, uh, yeah, if you if you went to on a newspaper and you saw in, let's say, for example, 1860, 
ships in, in New York, in La Havre, in all the ports, huge gales, Atlantic storms and all that, you know the next few days they're going to be litanies of shipwrecks all over the place. So that was a great guideline. Again, going back to weather and what the information. And um, so I found all this information, but all these other wrecks, so I did it chronologically, mm -hmm. all the way up to the present time, all the wrecks that were lost on this yeah, coast. sail. From um, the Sovereign Islands to Corpac to the Seven Heads, mm -hmm. all the way along the coast, yeah. Right. Yeah. And was this book for sale in the shop? Oh, yeah, I've got, I'll give you a copy. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are people buying them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I've, published two, I've published 2,000 copies and they're nearly all gone. Mm -hmm. This is about uh, four or five years ago now. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's called No Flowers on a Sailor's Grave. Shipwrecks of Kinsale and Corp, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, No Flowers on a Sailor's Grave refers to um, a, a, a poem about the sea. A, a sailor is lost at sea, so there's no flowers in his grave. We don't know where mm -hmm. he is, you know, so... It so to probably that. now you can do a new edition, adding the Inframar images of the shipwrecks, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah. three-dimensional. Yeah. And a lot of it is, you know, I have good information on some shipwrecks and very little information on others. But from the time you have uh, newspapers here, you know, local new, national newspapers in Ireland from about the 1850s on, there's, a, there's good record. You know, you find out about most shipwrecks. Mm. Before that, there's only shipwrecks were so frequent that it got very little mention, you know. Um, I think there's about like 10,000 of them in Irish waters. They say that, yeah. yeah. I, I would say that's a very conservative estimate. I'd say there's probably more that we don't, you know, and that's only because what we know, you know, we're talking about the, the, any kind of records that I've got. I mean, I've none before the 1600s, absolutely none. Mm. But there must have been thousands upon thousands of shipwrecks before Which then. They're already buried in sand. But yeah, they're buried in sand, they're wrecked, there's nothing left of them. So there's a, there's a huge amount, there has to be. You know, and when you look at what's very interesting, if you look at shipwrecks of the world on a world map, it's a, always the, the, the big greatest density of shipwrecks. The, there are a couple of places. Um, all the Western approaches to Britain, Ireland, France in the English Channel and the North Sea, huge, because obviously that was a huge center of commerce for hundreds of years. People living there and civilizations going back a long time. And down in Southeast Asia, the Straits of Malacca and Borneo and all down there, huge amount. And then you look at the New World, Australia, South America, all that. There are lots of shipwrecks, but not as many as the Old World. They're all in the Old World, mm -hmm. you know, most of them. Yeah. What about jellyfish? Um, mm. In your opinion, does it become more abundant now than it was like 40 years ago? That's an interesting question. Just from you know, visual the, 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 the Irish name for um, for um, jellyfish is smogorly roan. It means a seal's snot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> it's a good one, yeah. It's an interesting one. Um, I'll tell you what about jellyfish. If on a boat, the boat is in pumping water and the seacock is blocked, mm. the worst thing you can get in the seacock is a jellyfish. You will not pump water through jellyfish. They'll block the whole system. The weed will. You'll still get a certain amount of water going through. But if you get a jellyfish, it's like a plastic bag. They're, they're brutal. But um, I don't know. There are lots of different types of jellyfish that I haven't seen before. Yes. Mm. You know, I've seen lions, manes and stuff like I wouldn't have seen those a long time ago. But just, like just abundance is more or less the same 40 years ago and now? I think the same. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Just at a guess. Mm -hmm. I would say the same. Yeah, so you don't notice anything? No, I, I like... don't, no, I don't really, mm -hmm. no, no. And you, you'd hear about more, you know, lions, manes and compass jellyfish and all that. They were probably there, back there years ago, but we didn't know, you know. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't social media, so you didn't yes, know. Yeah. Social media can distort your idea about something as well. So I, I try, when I'm thinking about something like that, I try and leave social media <laughs> behind and just use your own. Mm -hmm. Not to be influenced by that, you know. Of course, yeah. Yeah, we, we a lot of people not thinking with their heads, they're thinking with their phones, yes, Facebooks exactly, and TVs. Exactly, like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I was just chatting to some marine biologists and people linking, saying like, oh, there's more jellyfish now, so it's linked to overfishing and that is linked to, of course, climate change. Mm. Climate change, so there's way more jellyfish now in Irish waters. But um, yeah, personally, like, I'm not spending that much out. Time out I, I have now, seen, like, so. you know, I don't know. 
Yeah. I don't know about that because I, I can remember one time we were up off um, the Isle of Man fishing for herring mm. and we're, it was a midwater pair trawling, midwater trawl. I remember we got, we f the whole bag stuck filled up with jellyfish and we're hauling, coming down off the Purla, there was jellyfish landing on top of us and your face was red and everything. And there was oceans of jellyfish, you know, I, I'm not sure that about that. That was when? That's 1980s, early 1980s, mm. you know. I'm not sure about that. So it probably know. all depends on the season, on particular conditions, yeah, yeah, on that particular yeah, year. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but, I, but I, I do, the one thing I think that are more, I've seen more, a lot more dolphins and a lot more stuff like that in recent, you know, in the last 20 years than I did in the previous 20 years, mm. you know. I remember going fishing in, in the Gaia, the last boat I had, and we're going out, and you just see for miles and miles and miles, dolphins jumping everywhere, just thousands of dolphins. You know, I don't, in my early years fishing, I don't, I have no recollection of seeing anything like that, mm -hmm. you know. Maybe because you were too busy with Maybe, fishing. maybe, 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 maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, and that could be it. That could well be it. And, you know, on a calm day, you'll see lots of stuff that on a bad day, you won't, you won't see it, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's a bit, the best analogy I can use for that is that um, before I used, to, I used to go into woods looking for squirrels and you'd never, you know, read squirrels and you'd say, you'd be looking up and you wouldn't see any. And then I read a book one day and this guy told me, look, when you look for squirrels, look down for nuts. and look for the nuts and you see they're stripped <laughs> and then look up and then you'll see them. You know, so that's... We're just looking for them for sightseeing or for, for sightseeing. Yeah, no, for sightseeing. Yeah. And um, so that's an example of you won't always see what you're looking for unless you're actually looking for it, mm -hmm. you know? I understand that. Yeah, you have to look specifically for something to find it, you know? But dolphins, they normally tend to follow the boat, like... Yeah. They do. Well, usually when you hear dolphins, yeah, if you're going out in the morning or you're lying in your bunk and you can hear them, you know, and then you, you know, they're, you hear the whistle, the kind of... Um, ultrasound. The, the ultrasound, so yeah, through, through the water, you know? Um, we spoke about I, I, I feel the only, uh, one thing I suppose uh, what I do think I think people don't understand fishermen in which sense they don't understand where they're coming from they're trying, protecting their livelihoods they don't understand how tough a life it is they don't understand um, the way fishermen see the way they see things they don't they underestimate the knowledge that fishermen have you know, they underestimate how challenging a job it is. And, um, but then the fishermen don't do themselves a lot of favours either, you know. So, yeah. What is the solution? I don't know what the solution is. I think education is the solution, mm. you know, w would help, you know. But then, if you say education, most fishermen aren't that well educated, so... They'll throw that in your face, and so I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. But I think when it comes to regulate, the problem is fishermen are being highly regulated now because in the past there was no regulation. If there was regulation in the past, it would be much easier mm. today. Fisheries would be a little bit stronger, and that regulation would come easier to them. I, I just think there's a different, in different countries, there's a different uh, attitude towards regulation. In Norway and place, they, they, they have no problem with regulation. But Norway's in a different situation. Norway, the Norwegians have their own waters to themselves. They don't share them with the EU. They don't share them with anybody else. We're sharing our own waters, a small quota, and the, and the richest probably fishing grounds in the EU with everybody else. So you can see why Irish fishermen would be very aggrieved by that, you know. Um, and I think because people are becoming more... I suppose people become more environmentally aware and as they become more environmentally aware they're coming down on fishermen that bit more. In the past people weren't environmentally aware so they didn't come down on fishermen. So the fishing industry is getting a lot of bad press, some of it justifiably so, some not, you know. So um, It's an interesting topic. You know? But I think it's better to keep, keep oceans clean, yes. eat fish instead of killing cows. <laughs> I, I agree with you, yeah, I totally agree with you, yeah. yeah. But um, I personally, I think, the, I think the, um, the way forward, and I think it should have been done a long time ago. When fishing, when I started fishing, 
there were areas of the ocean that weren't fished. They weren't fished for different reasons. You couldn't fish on rocky and rough ground because you could fish in some of it because the bottom gear, your bobbins and your hoppers and all that, technology and gear development wasn't such you couldn't get into a lot of these areas. Now technology, fishing gear technology as well as um, it has developed nets that you can get into these grounds. There's no sanctuary anymore. The runtime nobody fished ricks. Nobody fished the very rough ground that was fished there. There were different types of fishing. There's twin rigging now, triple rigging, multi-rigging, which wasn't there in the past. And there were sanctuaries for fish in the ocean. Those sanctuaries create new sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. I think we should have no take zones. Whereas, but I, but I think the fishermen should, they should designate with whoever else where the no take zones should be. They should have an, a say in this. And that you'd have closed areas that at certain areas where you have to bear in mind the smaller vessels in the area and how you're going to curtail, how you're going to enroach upon them. You can't have them get in the way of them making a living because they're limited where they can go and like bigger boats. So, for example, you might have an area 20 miles square, 30 miles square where you can fish and then you get to a zone and you have a 10 mile, a 10 kilometer or a five kilometer square zone that you can't fish. Nobody can ever fish mm -hmm. there again and you have a black box monitor it. So the fish inside in that area, if the area is that square, the fish, there's so much fish in that area after a while, they're so prolific that the fish come outside the edges yes. of it and then you can trawl up and down and you can net and you can catch fish outside that area. So that's your sanctuary. We need to create these natural Are you sanctuaries. saying they don't exist at the moment? They don't, the no, no, no. I know, no. I know that in Irish waters this couple of marine protected areas Yeah, yeah but they're for the temp corals, temporarily, but you know, small, no, like, but yeah. no. But the coral, there's no commercial fish that your cod don't live in the coral, mm. you know. Haddock don't well, live in the, when in the very I was deep doing water. This, like deep, deep ocean yeah, coral, yeah, coral yeah. research. Like we, we we filmed it with ROVs. You yeah, know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Because and we found a lot of fishing gear, yeah. lost fishing yeah. nets. So obviously somebody was what, trolling. What depth of water was this? Uh, we're talking about six to eight hundred meter water depth. Eight hundred. Oh, you were trolling it. And, yeah, and you get you, monkfish. You, you, you get monkfish on prawns yeah, in that. And, yeah, and yeah, on yeah. videos, I've seen a lot yeah, of monkfish as well. Well, well, but like corals would be completely smashed, and there would be like. Uh, fragments of fishing nets left. Well, but I always think, you know, at the, at the moment, the hake stock and the monk stock are very good. And one of the, my explanation for that is that hake and monk live in, can live in very, very deep water. So you've got from very, very deep water mm. out near the shelf all the way to the shore. That's a huge expanse of ocean. So that means the fish can come in from the deep, they can sort of, If you take place, you only get place from the shore out to maybe 35, Adams, you don't get a lot of place outside that. And sometimes you do in little place spots, but that's a very thin strip of the coast. So if you fish that area for place a lot, they're not going to come from somewhere else because they only live in that dip yes. of water. And same with different species. So whereas monkfish and hake have a big range. So th I'm sure that's one of the contributing reasons why they're prolific and the stock is very good at the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the quota in Ireland should be a way bigger than what it is for those species. Because a lot of the Irish fleet depend on those two species in the deep water, you know. And we should really have bigger quotas for those species, definitely. The Spanish have a huge quota for that, they can, the French, they can catch huge amounts of it. We haven't, you know. When yes, our boats are tied the up. prices up as well. Yeah, it? yeah. And um, we should, the, they're, they're sustainable fisheries because Again, because of the range of the species, you know, and the smaller the range of a species, the less sustainable that species is. You know, if you're going to only catch them in a certain area, you're going to catch them very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but I think no take zones, I, I just really think they're the answer. Oh, that's a good idea. Like, yeah, and I think they've experimented with it in New Zealand and places to, to good effect. But it's like everything else. Um, I remember when I started fishing, and I, I, well, I wasn't fishing very long, BIM were experimenting with square mesh panels on the top sheet of bags of trawls to leave small haddock and whiting out. And very quickly they proved that they worked, but that only became a law in recent years. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's nearly 40 years. Why did it take so long? You know? I mean, if that was implemented back when it see, was deemed to have worked, it would have made a huge difference. You know, but but it's and the last boat I fished on, I, I fished on a boat here for the last three years, another boat before I packed up fishing. 
before after I sold my own boat, I fished another boat for a couple of years. And we experimented with different mesh sizes. There were two of us on deck. And we moved, we were working 80 millimeter cotton mesh fish for prawns. Just to catch bigger fish. Uh, and to, to get don't more, to get more fish. So we'd spend maybe we get a shot of stuff. We spent five hours, four or five hours in the deck clearing the deck. Three, three to five hours clearing the deck with a big shot. Then we moved from 80 to 90. And instead of spending three hours in the deck, we were spending an hour and a half in the deck. Mm -hmm. Lot less discards, clean fish, mm -hmm. very less little bycatch. very little bycatch, you know. And that worked. You made a small you might have missed out a little bit, a small amount. But in the overall scheme of things, you're it's it's a win win situation. But I'm just surprised that there's a resistance to that. You know, there is a resistance to that. Among fishermen. In, I, I'm not saying all fishermen. A lot of fishermen there's not. A lot of fishermen agree want to go that way, you know, and do that. But there's a resistance from some fishermen. It's like everything else. There's always a few that won't you know, don't want to change and mm -hmm. um a lot of people don't like change, you know. So yeah. it's not it's natural, normal, you know. Um but but I think all this, I, I'm not saying that's the, all this should have been done years years ago, you know. That information was there. It could, BIM was there for a reason to to work with mm -hmm. gear technology and all that. But I don't think they did their job. When they spent nearly 30, 40 years with square mesh panels, something that was fairly conclusive after a couple of years, what were they doing, you know? Right. Okay, thanks very much, Ram. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Not at all. <laughs> and Not I'm all looking much. forward to boat yeah, yeah. with you on the boat someday. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll come out on this boat, like we go out on the other boat someday if you wanted to get around the old head and clips and all that. But it'll, it'll be probably, and you need fine weather for that, yeah. you know, at so other times of the year. I've but been out kayaking many times, like yeah, we went yeah. through, through yeah, the, the tunnels. Yeah, the caves, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um,